in Colombo North, uh, Colombo North Teaching Hospital, University Pediatric Unit. Uh, and first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Colombo North Teaching Hospital, the liver transplantation unit, for giving me this opportunity to speak on the hepatopulmonary syndrome in children. So the, my topic would be hepatopulmonary syndrome in children and its implications for liver transplant transplantation. Right. So we'll move on with the lecture first. Uh, first, we'll uh, go through the layout of the, uh, the, the, uh, the lecture. So I will be presenting two case histories for you and then go on to give a brief account on hepatopalmary syndrome. And later on, we will discuss on the implications for liver transplantation and the most important thing, the screening among children for with chronic liver cell disease to have a referral, right? And so the case history is wise. So my first case history is a three-year-old girl who presented to us with chronic liver cell disease uh, for uh, in view of liver transplant assessment. And she had biliary atresia and she has undergone Kasai procedure at the age of two months. And she, however, she had never had any decompensating episodes, any synthetic functions, and her synthetic functions were quite normal. And she had peripheral cyanosis and clubbing as, as well. And we have done an arterial blood test in her, in the room here, where it showed a pH of 7.47 with carbon dioxide partial pressure of 20. And uh, arterial carbon arterial partial pressure of oxygen is 27 and the alveolar arterial oxygen gradient is 89.9 and the room mass saturation was 59 so the next one is another girl 11 year old girl who yeah same condition she had biliary atresia underwent successful Kasai procedure and again referred to us for transplantation assessment with established chronic liver cell disease. In compared to the, our first child, this child had episodes of decompensation, like she had episodes of hematemesis and encephalopathy as well. And her synthetic functions were also kind of deranged. Albumin was low, clotting, the, the INR was prolonged. And she, she also had clubbing with central cyanosis as well. Her arterial blood gas on room now showed pH of 7.53 and partial pressure of oxygen of 49 and alveolar arterial oxygen difference or gradient of 64. Right. So we'll keep this in mind. We will not go into depth about these case histories at the moment and we'll get some idea or account on hepatopalmonary syndrome. Right. So what is hepatopalmonary syndrome? Right. First of all, we get some a background idea of the, this. Right? So different schools put forward different uh, etiopathologies to describe this, but more or less they were overlapping and more or less they are same, but the exact etiopathology is still yet to be found. So, and the different studies show varying prevalence of the disease as well, right? So, and uh, which dependent on the study population they used and the diagnostic criteria they used. So, so with regard to this diagnostic criteria, I will come, come uh, I will discuss them in later, later part of the presentation. And when it comes to this different study populations, the children showed a prevalence uh, of nearly 29 to 40%, while the adult prevalence was just four to 19%. So it's almost quarter or half of the the, the prevalence among children. So the main reason for this is that because of the worst prognosis of this entity, children who had hepatobalmary syndrome will not survive into their adulthood, making the prevalence, right? Making the prevalence in adults a bit low, right? And when we dig on to the etiology of the liver disease, most of these children found to have biliary atresia as their underlying etiology, which, which has led to the chronic liver cell disease. Right. So when we are discussing about the, the what is hepatopalmonary syndrome, yes, the first thing to have is the chronic liver cell disease. Right. So when you have chronic liver cell disease, you get 
increased synthesis and increased levels of endo endothelial interleukin because of the autosystemic shunt is one be broken down and with the increase of other cytokines in the circulation, the production will also increase. And meantime, the expression of these endothelial interleukin receptors, especially on the pulmonary vasculature, will also be uh, like attenuated or increased. Right? And as a result, this will, this will result in production of nitric oxide, carbon monoxide, and their levels will go up, which will in turn cause intrapulmonary vascular dilatation. And these vessels, the dilatation of these vessels usually occur in the lung bases rather than the apex. So, if you have intrapulmonary vascularization, obviously there will be over perfused areas which will act as a shunt. So, this will lead to ventilation perfusion mismatch, which causes hypoxia. Right? So, these three components together, make liver cell disease, intrapulmonary vascular dilatation, and hypoxia, the three together is called heptopulmonary syndrome. But to label it as a which, which there should not be any other disease that will account for the type C, right? so which can be proven by HRCT or chest X-ray, or even certain clinical findings may be there. Right? So the other problem is how to quantify this hypoxia. When do you call that the child is hypoxic? Yes, there are various uh, entities. So you can, so what usually you do is the arterial blood test. Remember, for this criteria, you do not have the saturation level. So you do the arterial blood gas and you see there is uh, the alveolar arterial oxygen difference when it's more than 15 millimeter mercury or when the arterial partial pressure of oxygen is less than 80 or else there is a fall in the arterial uh, partial pressure of oxygen by 5% or uh, more than 4 millimeter mercury when you when you turn the child or when you bring the child from supine to standing position and you keep at least 15 minutes standing or seated position, right? If, if either of these are present, you can label it as hypoxia. Going a bit further, you can test this or you can recheck this after giving 100% of oxygen to this child at least 15 to 20 minutes. So after giving that oxygen, you should expect and rise in the arterial partial pressure of oxygen to at least 200, right? So, if child is having hepatopulmonary syndrome, this, uh, this, this increment will not happen. It will remain less than 200. Going more advanced, you have the diffusion capacity, lung diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide, right? So, if the, the studies show that if it is less than 56%, the, the high, there is a higher chance of hepatopulmonary syndrome. And though this is a sophisticated investigation, right? this is not easy to be done when compared to the arterial blood gas, this is more sensitive. This will detect more and more. So this will also, this can also affect our prevalence because if you, things which won't be detected from the arterial blood gas can be detected from the uh, carbon monoxide diffusion capacity. So that is why some studies show higher prevalence. And another, in other hand, this diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide can predict the severity of your liver disease as well. Right? So, moving further, what is the clinical presentation? So, usually, this will be detected on active screening on follow up of chronic liver cell disease. If we have the knowledge of this, if we expect that this to happen in chronic liver cell disease, we will be actively screening. And sometimes this will be an incidental detection. Incidental detection. So, although that there will be certain clinical features which are not, even though these are not specific to them, these are common when it comes to hepatopulmonary syndrome. Dyspnea is the commonest clinical presentation. Uh, when comparing studies, around 90% to 95% of patients with hepatopulmonary syndrome at least have some degree of dyspnea. Cyanosis and plethora will be there around 80 to 90 percent, clubbing around 60 percent, and there is poor exercise tolerance as well. And the 
other stigma of chronic universal disease may or may not present, right? So may present. Now, this is very important. So this is the child. This is the child, our first case history, the three-year-old girl. So when you see this child, you will not, you can't definitely you can't definitely identify this child is suffering from chronic universal disease. She is well looking, smiling, there is no distended abdomen, looks adequately brown as well, with good muscle mass. Right? But this child has hepatopalmonary syndrome. So you can't go with the, uh, the, the morphological features of chronic universal disease. So I said that the hypoxia will be best assessed by the arterial gas. When you do it in the seated position, at least after 20 minutes in that position, right? So uh, the needle to machine time should be less than 15 minutes. You take the arterial blood gas, within 15 minutes, you should have the report. Then the sensitivity will be high. And the cutoffs, as mentioned earlier, the gradient of more than 50 and the arterial partial pressure less than 80. And in some, some blood gas machines will directly give the uh, alveolar arterial oxygen difference, right? But certain machines will not. So then there is an equation to get this, which I have given in the bottom of this slide. So this, this happens when you assume that the equation was done at sea level at 37 degrees Celsius room temperature. So the, there will be the calculated and the actual value will have some difference, right? But when you go going to assess the severity, you have four mild, moderate, severe, and very severe, right? So the alveolar arterial oxygen difference is more than 15, 15 or more than 15, and you do not take entity to consider the severity, right? So once you have this alveolar gradient cut off, you, you, you said that this child is hypoxic. Then depending on the arterial oxygen partial pressure, whether it is more than 80, 80 to 60, 60 to 50, or less than 50, you uh, you can grade the scale. And studies as I like, like more than like before 2002, they have taken it as 20 rather than taking as 50. So you so it's overestimation of the value. So underestimation of the value. So you may miss certain patients with hepatopalmonary syndrome if you take it as 20. So that is why in, in, in all the studies, the prevalence is a bit low compared to the newer studies. So when the child is having hypoxemia, you will go on to do a bubble echogram, echocardiogram, the transthoracic contrast echo study. So I will show you a small video clip on this. Hope you will see can clearly see this. So this is the adult, the video of an adult patient where you select a peripheral pain, usually uh, from the, the cubital fossa, you cannulate the patient, and then you select a three-way tap, right? And you are going to connect it. This will be done uh, by a, like the, the procedure will be done by a cardiologist when it comes to children, by a pediatric cardiologist. And the assistant will take two syringes, 10 ml syringes. One syringer will be filled with, now this syringer is filled with two milliliters of air. The previous one with around eight milliliters to nine milliliters of saline. So you close the end, which is going to the vein, and you keep the two syringes connected to each other. And after your, the cardiologist say, uh, go, ask to go ahead, you can mix the, two, the, mix the air and the solution between the two syringes, which you call agitation. So you can agitate them. So as you can clearly see, there will be production of bubbles. Right? So you can do this several times once adequate bubbles are being produced. And then uh, you will... Uh, you will open the uh, three-way tap towards the patient or towards the vein and you slowly inject it and you tell that the cardiologist that you are injecting, right? So after this injection, the, the, the cardiologist will do the echogram. So here, if I pause this for a while, this is on, on the left side of the screen is the right atrium. 
where the veins will drain. And this is the left atrium, which is in the right side of your screen. So when you start the echocardiogram, there will be bubbles in the left atrium, sorry, right atrium. Okay. So with, sorry, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the cardiac cycles, the bubbles will slowly appear on the uh, left atrium. So if you do it in slow motion, this is the first and the second beat. Still, there are no bubbles in the left atrium. Third beat is going, still no bubbles. Fourth beat, no bubbles. And when it comes to fifth and sixth bubbles, you get the appearance of these bubbles in the other side. Right? So, depend. so usually this happens in the fifth and the sixth cardiac cycles after injecting. And depending on the appearance of the bubble, the cardiologist will say this is a positive bubble study. And he will interpret depending on the, the amount of bubbles which will appear compared to the uh, right atrium whether this is mild, moderate, or severe. So that is completely dependent on the cardiologist. There's another study, a nuclear medicine study, T, uh, the Technetium 99 macro aggregated albumin scan, which is a nuclear medicine study performed when the child is in seated position and uh, the radioactive substance is injected to the peripheral vein. And you take series of images, which you focus on the brain and the lung where you compare the radioactive substance activity in the brain compared to that in the lung. So with this, you can calculate the shunt index. If it is 2% or more than that, that shows evidence of intrapulmonary vascular dilatation. So you can do the bubble echo and the uh, nuclear scan to tell whether there are intrapulmonary vascular dilatation. So when you compare this, I will just run through these. Bubble 2D echogram is more sensitive. That will pick more positive patients, but it's less specific. And when it comes to assessing the severity or the shunt quantification is completely observer dependent. But the good things are it's more sensitive, it's cost effective, and it's readily available. And you can detect any other cardiac shunts as well. But the Technetium 99 macro aggregated uh, albumin scan is expensive, requires more expertise, and there is radiation exposure, but it's more specific and it will quantify the shunt. But unfortunately, it's not available in treatment. There's another one, the pulmonary arteriogram, which is an expensive one. There is exposure to radiation and contrast, and that will need general anesthesia as well, where these children with hepatopulmonary syndrome will not be stent. So that is because of that, it's most important thing is whether it, that it, it can detect the morphology of the, these dilated vessels. And it might facilitate embolization as well. It's therapeutic in nature as well. But because of its, 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 expense, its expensive and the radiation exposure and difficult to go ahead with these children, this we can't, it's practically impossible. Right. So now we have some idea, right? Hopefully, we have some idea about hepatopulmonary syndrome. Right. Then we discuss about the most important part of this lecture is its implication for liver transplantation. Right. So let's be positive at the first go. Like rather than rather than discussing when to say no, we'll we'll discuss when to say yes for a liver transplant in this gym. Right. So hepatopulmonary syndrome is progressive and associated with considerable morbidity unless you intervene and you should intervene early rather than delay. And liver transplantation is the only modality which will result in complete reversal of this condition. So studies have shown that there is complete reversal, right? And they have, they have tried different medical therapies with, and they have not given any promising results. And the hepatopulmonary syndrome warrants liver transplantation irrespective of your uh, MELD or PELD score. So PELD is pediatric end-stage liver disease score. MELD is the model for end-stage liver disease, which will be using in children more than 12 years as well, right? So, and those who are like, there are someone who are less familiar with this score, they, this MELD or PELD scores will take into consideration, especially the decompensating episodes, the albumin level, the INR level, uh, and the serum creatinine where the kidneys are affected and the MELD and PELD score will be higher if the child has had episodes of 
like likely to be higher if they had episodes of uh, SIDs, encephalopathy, hematoma, right? So the important thing is those episodes and the score will not, will not affect the need for the liver transplantation when it comes to hepatoconjugal syndrome. And the early detection will facilitate transplant and good outcomes. So, and as you clearly see this, I, I, I took it from a research and illustration from a research they have published. So after six months of post-transplantation, these patients like clearly show a significant reduction in the art alveolar arterial oxygen difference as well as increase in the partial pressure of arterial oxygen as well. So it has gone at least comes to near normal. Okay? So this shows the importance of liver transplantation in these children. Right. And this is another, another good illustration in several, several study groups where they have compared the survival of children who had hepatopalmary syndrome and did not underwent liver transplant compared to children who underwent liver transplant. So you can clearly see in all these four categories, those who underwent liver transplantation had a good survival benefit or good survival trait. And those who did not underwent liver transplantation had a worse prognosis. So this also shows that liver transplantation is definitely indicated in this children. Right. So when to say yes, you know you need to know who to say yes, right? Are you are you telling yes, we can transplant to you, to you as well? No. So, so previously they did not have a good selection criteria for this, but now since 2002, they are practicing, in, uh, especially in Europe, they are practicing standard exception points, which will be added to your, the, the model for end-stage liver disease score, right? So uh, because of that, this will, because your male score, because the male score is the one usually you use to, uh, time the transplant, but the male score will male score did not illustrated or did not included the hepatopalmary syndrome. So they 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 combined or they 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 merged the hepatopalmary syndrome into this, right? So this will prioritize patients with severe hepatopalmary syndrome. Especially they they use this for ones with severe hepatopalmary syndrome, so that they will receive early transplantation. Right? And in it, it in turn, it gave better outcome as well. And this will also deprioritize the patients who had very severe hepatopalmary syndrome. Right, So when you go back, if you can remember the previous chart where we graded the severity, if the partial pressure of oxygen in the artery is less than 50, you grade it as very severe hepatopalmary syndrome. And the, this, this, this exception points will deprioritize them and will mirror the unfavorable post-transplant outcome in them. And the ones who had mild hepatopalmary syndrome, that is your uh, alveolar, alveolar arterial oxygen gradient is less than, more than 15, but your arterial oxygen saturation, uh, arterial oxygen partial pressure is more than 80. So these milder ones, they can be managed without, an, uh, without a liver transplantation at, at, like, at that goal, but you should, Make sure that there will be meticulous monitoring in them and they will be needed, they, they will be dependent sometimes on home oxygen therapy as well. So when it comes to Europe, they are mainly using these oxygen therapies, the domiciliary oxygen therapies to be used in the home. But when it comes to Sri Lankan setup, we usually do not have these facilities prevailed much with the socioeconomic background of this patient. Right? So, when it comes to moderate and severe hepatopalmary syndrome, with these exception points as well, they will require a liver transplant early. And the selective patient selection is important when it comes to very severe hepatopalmary syndrome, right? So very severe hepatopalmary syndrome will not be like completely rejected with this, right? But we are going to be selectively selecting, right? So, this is how they have like adjusted the middle score. When the saturation is between 60 to 55, uh, the middle score is 22 and 50 to 51, middle score is 24. So both these two groups are having severe hepatopalmary syndrome 
and their male score is higher and they will be prioritized in the liver transplant. But when it is less than 50, the male score is 26. So someone, some, some may think that yes, they are also prioritized. But when you discussing on the MELD, it's a scoring system for assessing liver disease severity that has been validated to predict, predict the three month, uh, to predict the three month waiting list mortality. And however, this score poorly predicts overall as well as the post transplant survival. And that that does not consider complications that affect the outcome uh, as well. And uh, the child who has decompensating episodes will invariably have a greater melt or pale score, but that will not depict the severity of hepatopalmonary syndrome as I discussed earlier. And they said the male score, if it is more than 25, the relative risk of mortality within 30 days of liver transplantation is high. So that is why when it comes to severe hepatopalmonary syndrome, where the saturation is less than 50, their male score is 26, right? So the relative risk of mortality within 30 days of liver transplantation is high. So then you need to balance whether you are taking this risk or not. Right. But when it comes to newer studies, right, this is a Eurotransplant experience in the Euro, several countries, they have assessed 530 patients, right, over a period of four years after transplantation as well. So this is one of the one of the largest study which was carried out in Euro, right? So and uh, so there were 442 patients who did not have hepatopalmonary syndrome and underwent liver transplant. And there were patients with uh, severe hepatopalmonary syndrome, severe hepatopalmonary syndrome, 88 who underwent transplant. So when you come to, because this is after they have selected using the standard exception scores. So the pre-transplantation mortality, we know hepatopalmonary syndrome, will be having a worse, worse prognosis uh, compared to the ones without hepatopalmonary syndrome. But here, the pre-transplantation mortality has reduced. That is because when you go to the line below, the percentage underwent liver transplant was higher in the group with hepatopalmonary syndrome, severe hepatopalmonary syndrome. Because of that standard exception scores, these patients were prioritized. These patients were prioritized. So they had a higher chance of receiving a liver transplant. So their waiting list mortality reduced. And 3% in each were removed because they were unfit for a liver transplant. And the most important thing, the deaths following liver transplant, the ones who did not have hepatopalmonary syndrome was 24% compared to 39% in the ones we had severe hepatopalmonary syndrome. So numerically, yes, there is a risk. There is a there is a risk of death. But when you when you compare the p-value, which is 0 0.014, statistically, this is not a significant difference. So statistically, the both groups experiencing similar death rates because of the liver transplant, so after the liver transplant. And in the two-year period of following, follow up. The both groups had reduction in the survival benefit, but the difference is not that much, that much significant. So severe hepatopalmonary syndrome, they are benefited, not only they are benefited, uh, compared to the ones with hepato no hepatopalmonary syndrome, they have a, uh, a comparatively fair, a fairly normal outcome as well. So the earlier preoperative uh, in earlier preoperative partial pressure of oxygen less than 50 millimeter Hg, the pre-transplantation arterial partial pressure of oxygen, if it is less than 50, that is severe, or the technetium scan showing more than 20% shunting, they will show they were bad predictors or they were predictors of death in hepatopalmonary syndrome after transplant. So there was a study conducted in United States of America where they have quantitatively compared the oxygenation versus the three-year survival rate after transplant. So 
quantitative, they, they, they were able to quantitatively evaluate the quantitative values of partial pressure of oxygen, arterial partial pressure of oxygen, and the outcome. So there was a good, good survival when it comes to 54 to 44 millimeter HD partial pressure of arterial oxygen. But when it comes to if the partial pressure of oxygen less than 44 before transplant, there is a significant reduction in the three year survival rate. So, this is another study uh, which was conducted in India, right? So, they were assessing 17 patients who had hepatopalmonary syndrome from the beginning and after post transplantation as well. So, there are six patients in this graph, the top six. They are the ones who had very severe hepatopalmonary syndrome, right? So, uh, when, when, you, when you see the partial pressure of arterial oxygen, Lowest being 34, highest being 49 in that six patients. And their alveolar arterial oxygen is also high. And the other important thing you should uh, remember, you should be like focusing here is when you compare the PELD or the MEL scores with these uh, arterial partial pressures. So the number six patient who had a MEL score of 24 had an arterial oxygen partial pressure of 49 compared to the patient two who had a male, uh, male score of seven, only seven, but the arterial partial pressure is way below the patient C. So this shows, this shows your male or the male score will not, uh, will not predict the severity of the hepatopalmonary syndrome, right? So they have received the liver transplant and uh, So, and then the outcomes, when you are considering the outcomes, the, 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 uh, there were like late onset sepsis was seen median 16 in uh, very severe hepatopalmonary syndromes compared to uh, like the onset of the sepsis is 7, right? So the p-value was 0 0.03. But the, the important thing is oxygen the duration of oxygen requirement, which comes to 36 days of median in very severe hepatopalmonary syndrome group compared to a median of three days with a significant p-value, statistically significant difference. The duration of post-operative ventilation, the duration, the total duration of hospital stay, right? And both of them were statistically insignificant, though there is some difference. It was insignificant. So both groups experienced similar kind of hospital stay, similar kind of requirement for ventilation, sim uh, similar kind of risk for sepsis following transplant. Transplant, But the main difference was the duration of oxygen requirement. And there were significant difference with refractory post of hypoxemia and intracranial hemorrhage. I will come to, like, I will, I will discuss uh, about the incidence of intracranial hemorrhage in these children, why it happens. So those two plus the, the requirement of oxygen was high in this group when it comes to very severe hepatopalmonary syndrome. So what is this post of hypoxemia? So the longer length of supplementary oxygen requirement was associated with higher pre liver transplantation hemoglobin concentration. This is the other finding in this study, right? So they, they, they check people, who, the children who required oxygen for more than seven days had a pre-transplantation hemoglobin of more than 30. 10 of them had that value. But those who required less than seven days, only one had a high hemoglobin level. Yes. So the pre-transplantation hemoglobin level, which, which in fact is an indirect measure of the level of hypoxemia as well, is important when predicting the oxygen requirement. And similarly, they have a difference between the oxygen requirement and the shunt. So when the shunt index is more, you expect them to have a refractory hypoxemic period post-operative. So severe post-transplant hypoxemia is defined when your saturation, arterial saturation is less than 55%, despite the child or the patient being on 100% oxygen, right? This is out of proportion to any concurrent 
long process and this is not relieved by simple maneuvers such as position. So, in these patients, inhaled nitric oxide, oxide therapy was used as a rescue measure, right? So, those who have a refractory hypoxia and as a, as a side effect of this inhaled nitric oxide therapy, they tend to get intracranial hemorrhage. That is why three patients out of the six uh, who received in, uh, inhaled nitric oxide had intracranial hemorrhage. So that is also a risk factor. Risk when you do transplantation for children with uh, very severe hepatopathy syndrome. So with the inhaled nitric oxide therapy, the target was to achieve a saturation of more than 92%, at least 92% or more than that. So going for this uh, flow chart, so this is a, this is a, you can get some idea when this hypoxia, when there is saturation less than 85%, while the child is on 100% oxygen, first you do change the position or you give a peak and expiratory pressure trial of 10 centimeter water, right? So if this works, if the saturation picks up, yes, you can come down with the oxygen to 60% and then slowly come down. But the problems happen, especially in this very severe hepatopulmonary syndrome, you will not achieve this with positioning or simple measures. So you will have to start inhaled nitric oxide via the ventilator circuit. So when you are hitting hard, you should hit hard. So you give it 10, 10 ppm inhaled nitric oxide. And you check whether you achieve uh, uh, the saturation of more than 90%, right? So hopefully, if you achieve that, you can uh, continue the same rate of inhaled nitric oxide therapy, but you come down the, the fraction of inhaled air. So you can come down to 60%. So if he's maintaining saturation, 92% or more, with 10 ppm inhaled nitric oxide, and you can titrate the oxygen to 60%. So first you titrate the oxygen rather than titrating the ni inhaled nitric oxide. And if this is maintaining, you come down with inhaled nitric oxide as well. So remember that if, if this is not working with inhaled nitric oxide as well, you may need tracheostomy. So there is increased risk of tracheostomy in these patients as well. So if everything is going smoothly, you are achieving the saturations, you are maintaining the saturations, you can come down with your oxygen level as well. So, so, so you first, uh, when you are weaning off, you first wean off or you remove your nitric oxide, inhaled nitric oxide from the therapy. And then after 60%, you come down uh, with your oxygen therapy as well. So the worst case scenarios is, where you do not achieve the saturation of 92% with your inhaled nitric oxide, right? Then you may consider methylene duo ECMO, so which is which is a, a difficult procedure. You don't have enough facilities to do extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So this is a, some first case scenario. Right? So this is one of the challenges you get when you transplant to very severe hepatopulmonary syndrome patients, right? So what are the other measures which have led to good outcomes in liver transplantation, which in fact improve the outcome in this, sometimes in this very severe, high, very severe hepatopulmonary syndrome as well. So one thing is the advantages in the intensive care units where you have inhaled nitric oxide. In other countries, you have ECMOs as well. We do have ECMOs in two hospitals. And uh, in Karapiti, uh, I think in DMH. So, hospital protocols for managing end stage liver disease and the critical illnesses have also improved throughout these years. And in the ICU setup, the liver trends they are using, especially they use low tidal volume ventilation, which will reduce the barotrauma to the lungs. The sepsis bundles they are practicing, where you can detect the sepsis early and you treat it effectively. And the non non invasive ventilation methods we do have in our setups as well. And the outcome is better if you do go for a liver live donor, sorry, the live donor uh, liver transplantation uh, versus a disease donor transplant. Because when you go for a live donor liver transplant, the 
the, the graft is immediately available and there's a better quality graft. There is a decreased cold and warm ischemia time as well. And you, this will be an elective procedure. So you have much time to prepare the patient and to stabilize him, to improve his exercise tolerance as well. So a live donor transplant will be give a better outcome as well. And the preoperative optimization, right? So these children will require home oxygen and it's very difficult in our setup, but in other countries, they give home oxygen. So when it comes in during the transplant waiting list, they have like they have a better, better condition and they will withstand the liver transplantation more. Right. So when you are discussing about these favorable outcomes, uh, so there's some problem. So now we have discussed when to say yes to this liver transplant. So when to say no to liver transplantation is the other problem, right? So the preoperative, uh, the preoperative uh, arterial partial pressure of oxygen, the, the preoperative alveolar arterial gradient, and the diffusion, lung diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide, they can be used to assess the severity of hepatopulmonary syndrome, right? But to, to assess whether this child will actually needing a liver transplant, whether he is a good candidate for liver transplant, will not be assessed by either of these three. Well, you can get some idea, but it is the hyperoxia test is a better, better predictor to tell that whether uh, this child can go for a liver transplant. So if the arterial partial pressure of oxygen does not rise, more than 200 millimeter mercury, even after you have given 100% oxygen for a period of 20 minutes, the outcome following transplant will be poor. So it's very important to do this hyperoxia test. Right? Right. So we'll come back to, we'll come again to this, our two case histories. So the things up to which we have learned, so when you compare these two cases, the three-year-old girl who was like same diagnosis, both have biliary atresia, one is older, much older, and this older child, 11-year-old child, had episodes of hematomesis, had episodes of encephalopathy, the sympathetic functions were deranged, right, compared to the other child who did not have any of them. But clinically, both of them had cyanosis and clubbing, and clubbing was centrally seen in the 11-year-old child as well. But so obviously the MELD or the PELD score is higher in the 11-year-old child. But when you consider the on-air blood gases, the alveolar arterial oxygen gradient and the partial pressure of oxygen was, is low in the three-year-old child. So she, hepatopulmonary syndrome-wise, the three-year-old girl is having a severe condition. And you did a bubble 2D echocrum in, uh, in this three-year-old girl, it became positive. And the ABG was done with 100% oxygen for 15 minutes, repeated the blood gas, the arterial oxygen still 50. It does not come up to 200. And the gradient was 633. We actually proceeded with giving oxygen for 30 minutes as well, but the arterial oxygen remained the same. And in the other child also gave a positive 2D echo, the bubble echo. And the ABG was done, the hyperoxia test was done and the ABG was repeated, repeated and her arterial oxygen partial pressure also did not come up to the expected levels of 200. So both these children, though they had different clinical scenarios, they had different PELD scores, both of them had hepatopulmonary syndrome. Both of them had positive bubble echograms. And when you categorize the severity depending on the partial pressure of oxygen in the arteries, both had very severe hepatopulmonary syndrome. The 11 year old girl was marginal in that, but both had a very poor hyperoxia test. So unfortunately, both of them did not 
were not candidates for liver transplantation. So, because in, when you consider the other things, they were good candidates for liver transplant. Only this was hindering the, the proceeding. So it is important to screen for hepatopulmonary syndrome because of that content. And especially your male dog pell scores will not, uh, will not uh, uh, determine the severity of hepatopulmonary syndrome. So patient's liver disease status itself will not predict the morbidity and mortality of hepatopulmonary syndrome as well. So a child with severe hepatopulmonary syndrome might, might not have other indications which which would warrant a liver transplant. So you may think that this child is having recurrent encephalopathies, he is having varices, he is having upper GI bleeding, so he needs liver transplant. But they won't predict the need for liver transplantation when it comes to hepatopalmonary syndrome. And the screening for hepatopalmonary syndrome and you referring to a liver transplant center should not wait till the end stage liver disease. Because we, we know that even with, even with the good liver function, you can have a severe hepatopalmonary syndrome. So screening for hepatopalmonary syndrome is simple. So this is a study which they have used the, they have assessed the role of pulse oximetry, a simple study involving 245 patients. So they have found that when the saturation is less than 92% in the supine position, or when the saturation drop is 4%, when you change from supine to upright position, uh, you can go ahead with further diagnostic procedures and you can pick up hepatopalmonary syndrome. So there has been like four patients with hepatopalmonary syndrome in this study population and four of all four of them had the pathological saturation measurement. So the 100% sensitive, though there were 17 pathological uh, saturation readings, they have not missed the hepatopalmonary syndrome. So it's important, it's better to diagnose rather than missing. So this is a very good, very good bed, bedside, a clinic level test. You can, uh, you can refer to a liver transplant unit. So in summary, what we have learned is hepatopalmonary syndrome is, a com is common among cirrhotic children. And the, the prevalence is around 29 to 40%. And early screening is feasible with simple saturation monitoring by pulse oximetry. And a cirrhotic child with hepatopalmonary syndrome has decreased survival compared to a one with no hepatopalmonary syndrome. And the morbidity and the mortality is worse with the progressing of hepatopalmonary syndrome. And the liver transplantation is the single most viable treatment modality which will reverse or which will cure the hepatopalmonary syndrome. And post-operative hypoxemia is the commonest complication or the commonest challenge we experience in hepatopalmonary syndromes who undergo liver transplant. And the inhaled nitric oxide therapy have improved the outcomes. And the take-home message should be regular surveillance and early referral to a transplant center results in achieving good outcomes for these patients. So we have come to the end of our lecture. Uh, so any questions? Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Hashan, for that excellent uh, lecture. So now uh, we'll be taking questions from the audience. Any questions from our audience? Natasha, this is Miranti. Yes, Miranti. 
Yeah, so actually, uh, not, this is not a question. I just wanted to make a comment. And firstly, I would like to congratulate Hashan for that excellent presentation. Yeah. Um, Hashan correctly mentioned that mild hepatopulmonary syndrome can be watched very carefully while oxygen being administered. Uh, I just wanted to add a comment for that statement, actually. Uh, what he mentioned is absolutely true. The challenge in our setup is the unavailability of home oxygen is one thing. The other thing is, in other countries, they do have readily available graphs because their programs are mainly dependent on cadaveric uh, graphs, and they do have graphs which are readily available. But as far as our program is concerned and our children are concerned, we heavily rely on live donors. So uh, finding a live donor again is a difficulty because we have to go through the blood group matching. And whenever there is blood group matching, the mother or father is found to have fatty liver or diabetes. So those are challenges when we have donor selection. So I just wanted to modify that statement saying that the children should be referred very early to a liver transplant center where the team can be in contact with the family and uh, they can prepare the potential donors because that child will anyway require transplant after some time, though the child would have mild hepatopulmonary syndrome at the time of referral. So I would like to add something to it saying that anybody who has got even mild hepatopulmonary syndrome should be in contact with the liver transplant center as early as possible to facilitate donor selection, donor preparation, and a timely transplant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Niranti. Um, any more questions or any comments, uh, anything to add from the audience? Rana Shah is Bhagya. Hashan, congratulations, excellent lecture. Um, do you know how long it takes for uh, this uh, hypoxemia to resolve uh, post-op following a successful liver transplant? Uh, if that's okay, can I answer that question, sir? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so um, the studies show variable results, but uh, if I in Birmingham, uh, I've seen a number of kids who had hepatopulmonary syndrome and the longest duration I have seen in my experience is the six months, where even after the transplant, that child required oxygen, home oxygen for up to six months where the child was fine afterwards. That is in view of my experience, but as far as we consider studies, we don't have much follow-up data, I'm afraid, sir. Yeah, the child's no, pre-transplant saturation uh, is around uh, 92 percent. Yeah, the issue is, uh, uh, do they require, no, my, I have, we have no experience with uh, transplanting uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome even in adults. So uh, in your experience, uh, do they require prolonged ventilation post-op or can they be take wind off uh, relatively quickly and then manage just on uh, oxygen by face mask or high flow oxygen? Yeah, actually not, sir. They did not require prolonged ventilation. The maximum duration of ventilation, which I have seen out of uh, seven kids I've seen there uh, during my two-year period, the maximum period which required ventilation was seven days, actually. And for that, also, there was a concurrent pneumonia. And afterwards, the children were with nasal trunk oxygen while being in the boat. So that was seven days, uh, the maximum, with the concurrent pneumonia. Otherwise, usually after two days, like they're out of the ventilator, but on oxygen, but remain on oxygen through a nasal trunk. All right, thank you, Vera. Thank you, sir. Any more questions? Um, OK. 
Okay, in the absence of uh, any more questions, I think we'll conclude the session for today. Once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Hashan for that excellent presentation. And also, I thank Dr. Miranti uh, for contributing and enlightening us from your knowledge and experience. Um, and, uh, yeah, and thank you. Uh, and a big thank you to our audience for joining us today. And I wish all of you a pleasant week ahead. Thank you.